On Tuesday, November the 28th, 2023, a historic moment happened when the National Citizens Inquiry, known as the NCI, tabled their massive report to the Canadian public. It was really quite an occasion and a reflection of a long story of citizens coming together and offering leadership to thoughtfully ask the question, how did Canada do? What were the impacts of the management of COVID-19? A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So with me here today are the chairperson of the NCI, as well as the administrator of the NCI. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Ken Drysdale, the chairman. Pleasure to be here. And as well as the administrator, Chess Crosby. Welcome. Thanks, David. Pleasure. Well, it's uh, it's terrific to have you because uh, we've got lots to cover. I'm very excited about uh, the overview of the report, which I did. Uh, I, I'm, I believe I've read most of it. Uh, so it was really quite a breathtaking document, and I encourage people to look on it online at the uh, National Citizens Inquiry. But I want to start off with a really basic question uh, to you, Ken, and that is, um, how did the NCI come about and why did you do this massive report? Well, the NCI came about because the the actions that were taken by the government, by institutions, and by private companies were un, unheard of in this country. They reached into every aspect of Canadians' lives, from their right into their family relationships to their relationship with their God, their their church services, their jobs. They even instructed Canadians or coerced Canadians to take medical procedures, and and no one was taking a breath. To, take a, to examine what had been done and to decide whether or not there were things that were done right or things that were done wrong. Now, in addition to that, the Canadian people had developed a mistrust of the government given the latest number of uh, investigations that the government carried out on themselves. Uh, there were allegations that uh, friends of families were appointed to those commissions and uh, a lot of people were questioning them. So a combination of the necessity of taking a sober look at what had happened, plus uh, can, the Canadian citizens' distrust of the government commissions was really the driving force behind this. Indeed. Uh, the report is divided up into four parts, and it is really quite breathtaking in its um, summation um, on so many levels. There's civil recommendations, social impacts, economic and of course, health. So we do want to dive into a couple of them. And so one of the things I wanted to zero in on is really kind of a profound revelation I think a lot of Canadians would be stunned with. And that, and I'm going to turn to you, Chess, and that goes to the, the admissions of kind of known facts that relate to the um, safety and um, efficacy, the effectiveness of these vaccines. So could we walk through those a little bit? So... Um, one of them, I, I believe, has to do with, um, golly, are, are, did Health Canada say that these are actually safe vaccines to use? Uh, well, we've all heard that marketing phrase, and it's on the website. But what they did not do is make a determination of safety and effectiveness. It's not in the approving order or regulation. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is the answer. That safe and effective slogan is just that. In fact, you could go further and call it not just a marketing slogan, but a PSYOP slogan. You could call it propaganda. Wow. You could call it neuro-linguistic programming. programming. Uh, but it has no basis in any scientific determination by Health Canada. Okay, so just, just hold that for a sec, because I don't want to bury the headline. When Canadians think about Health Canada, we would assume that drugs go through a careful process and they're reviewed for their health and safety, but you refer to um, a regulation and it doesn't specify that. Is, what, is that what you're saying in that, in that, um, in that uh, research? Yeah, well, I assume the same thing about you know, determination of safety. Who would have dreamt that 
um, every public health official pretty much in the land, and it's a big land, uh, would be repeating something that turns out never to have been determined by Health Canada. Ken, do I have that right or wrong? Well, the, the actual regulations did require objective proof of uh, safety and efficacy for any new drug or food product. The trouble was, is that the government altered that requirement in when they originally authorized the use of these of the so-called vaccines. So what they did was they changed the test that was in the original uh, regulations and the test was an objective test, an objective test, uh, an example of, a, of an objective question might be what is two plus two and the answer is four. They changed it into a subjective question and a subjective question might be how do you feel about two plus two? So when it came down to safety and effectiveness, they changed it from an objective proof to mm -hmm. Well, give us enough information that one might conclude it was safe and effective. Mm -hmm. And so that so that the, the actual original regulation required it. And then to make matters worse, the interim order that authorized it only had a 12 month lifespan. And at the end of that, they actually changed the regulation. The permanent regulation is now changed to allow COVID-19 uh, uh, injections to be authorized under the same subjective test. Hmm. Okay, so this is a very important point of information. And then the, the other second part is the, the, the authorization of, of a number of the vaccines seem to be based on what it was approved by the, the Center for Disease Control and in the United States, those authorities, <laughs> was different in terms of what was produced. Is, is, am I understanding that correctly from, from your report? Yes. Yes, that is correct. What happened was is uh, the samples that uh, were were went through the testing process were um, uh, small batch or laboratory samples, and then when they went into m major production, and this was a and this is a very complex uh, production methodology, they were producing something that was different than what was uh, produced in the small batches and, and submitted in their tests. So there were reports from witnesses of all kinds of contamination. We, we've just recently seen uh, news reports that um, uh, Health Canada is reporting that there were uh, contamin RNA or DNA, partial string DNA contamination. There was, um, they found out when they were uh, giving the injections that, they, um, that the, uh, the samples were segregating. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were, they were starting to separate. So then they came up with a procedure where you were supposed to turn it back and forth five times. Mm -hmm. So there is a, it was very different what was tested and then what was produced and provided to the public. Gosh, it almost sounds like a bit of a bait and switch. Am I being too dramatic in using that kind of phrase, Chess? No, I've seen it used by others. I use it myself. Uh, just Ken briefly to come back without flogging a dead horse, but in the approval order on point number one here, or sorry, I should say the approval instruments, the words safe and effective don't appear. Isn't that correct? I believe that's, uh, well, it, it, um, it, um, in the interim order, it does say that if you can, if you can come to a conclusion that it's saved, you know, it doesn't say that it is safe, but you can, you can come to a conclusion. So it's, it's, again, it's, it, they changed it from a proof to a feeling or to a subjective test. Yeah, I have a good feeling about this injection. So let's go with it, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it yeah. certainly is a revelation. I, again, encourage uh, listeners uh, not to take um, our discussion for granted, but to, to look at the report but it, the, you know, it's also in the context that um, we have a lot of other bombshells going on, including the recent tabling uh, of the Texas lawsuit by the uh, Attorney General Ken Paxton in that state. And we'll get into that in a moment. But there's a lot of parties that are waking up to this reality. And one of them is the fact that, um, as you mentioned, Ken, the, the vaccines um, appear to be adulterated in the sense that they have DNA contaminants. I'm not uh, clear on exactly what the clinical implications of that, but the facts are not in dispute. Is that right, Chess, that those vaccines are adulterated? Yeah. So to be clear, um, 
I, I think the report then does articulate a very profound question, is that given the above, even those admissions from those authorities, would you have consented to be vaccinated, um, let alone would you have authorities push this vaccine so hard on people who, frankly, had legitimate reasons for saying, well, A, this is my body, uh, B, I have maybe health concerns, and, um, you know, I have concerns about having enough information to actually make an intelligent decision about whether to get vaccinated. So I think that your report um, points out these issues very well. And I think my question is, do you sense that uh, authorities are, are kind of becoming aware of, of the, the, the corner that they've painted themselves in and, and uh, Canadians by, by pushing this kind of vaccine mandate? Well... You know, it's very hard to say what they're coming to a realization of or not. It it almost seems to me. I mean, you know, we struggled with, um, and it wasn't it wasn't in our mandate to understand what was in their heart or what was in their mm -hmm. thought process. Uh, but but what were their actions? And unfortunately, a lot of a lot of these kinds of decision makers are in a bubble. They're in a in a in an echo chamber of what they want to hear, and they produce it. They produce an a, a, an idea or a thought, and it just comes back at them. So I don't know how much they actually know at this point. Mm -hmm. Also, when you look at the qualifications of some of the people that were involved with this, um, you know, they, they essentially in our report we mentioned that the Minister of Health, although it is somewhat of an of a practice that ministers don't always have expertise in their area. Certainly, uh, during this crisis, you think that perhaps they would have done that, but but we could not find any health uh, experience or any medical training in the health in, in the health minister at the time and during this critical stage. So that's a, to me that was a revelation as well. No, it it really was, and I think that um, one of the commissioners and they should all be very much commended. Um, you know, really made, you know, superb a point, uh, points that it almost seemed like there were various officials, uh, you know, advocating different uh, recommendations that were not necessarily based on the science. And, and if anything, they worked hard to squelch any kind of healthy debate and discussion around the very issues that were clearly raging debates among experts. And I think that's a very important revelation that your re report makes. So one of the things I, I did notice is that... Um, you, uh, you had 305 witnesses give testimony under oath uh, before um, a team of lawyers. Uh, your uh, lead lawyer, of course, Sean Buckley, did an incredible job. But as you listened to those 305 witnesses across Canada, um, were there certain highlights that struck you? Uh, and I'm going to ask you, Chess, and then Ken. I'd have to say, personally, it was... Um the petty cruelties that were visited on many ordinary citizens, uh, for example, in contexts like uh, make, making very young children wear masks in school, hmm. it seemed to bring out the inner demon in a lot of people. Wow. So, so the sense that there are a lot of almost like you said, petty cruelties um, and, and particularly children. I mean, children really suffered, as you outlined powerfully in the report, with all these shutdowns. You could go to Walmart, you could go to the liquor store, but your kids could not go to school, even though it was verified that their risks were, were infinitesimal, really. Is that right, Chess? Yeah, it never made sense. And, you know, as for masking children, there was... Uh, a very dispositive study that came out only in the last week. Uh, it was a meta-analysis of everything uh, that's ever been published about children and masking. That's specifically mm -hmm. children. You know, and found no benefit to it whatsoever and much harm. Well, what about Ken? What was the highlight for you as you listened to those hundreds of witnesses and varieties of experts from around the world? Highlight is the it's not the right word, <laughs> but probably the two most shocking stories that I heard was the one of Sheila Lewis, mm. who, in my opinion, was executed. Um, and for those of you who don't know that story, she was a lady that needed a transplant Indeed. and had gone through a year or more of um, uh, of screening, and she was getting close to getting that transplant in the fall, 
in the late summer or fall of 2022. And that's important, that date. At that time, they insisted that she take the COVID-19 vaccine. And despite that she had antibodies against COVID-19, she refused to take it. She was afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And they took her off the transplant transplant list and she subsequently died. Horrible. Now, Now, the reason the date was so important is because in late summer and early fall of 2022, we already knew that the vaccines weren't safe, they weren't effective, they didn't stop spread. Uh, the CDC was reporting that one of the um, one of the main um, side effects was getting a COVID infection, and that's on their site today still. And perhaps the other one that really struck me was a story from a lady in, in Saskatoon whose mother was uh, getting her shot in a local uh, pharmacy, and there was a line of people and when she got the shot a, a short time later, a few minutes later at Wellston, the pharmacy, she dropped dead on the floor. Oh, my. And, and what was shocking about that is nobody in the line waiting to get the shot got out of the line. And that, to me, was just shocking. That that tell, shows you the level of terror and propaganda that had been visited on the Canadian people. It really is truly remarkable. I, David, if I could just interject one thing. Ken used... A, very evocative word, executed, in respect of Sheila Lewis. Um, And, you know, that brings up the question of potential criminality Mm -hmm. and the laying of criminal charges, which is something that Ken and his colleagues did address as well. And it's important to bring that up, I think, because it's a measure of the, uh, the, the dimensions of the unacceptable misconduct that has been engaged in by officials and by the organized medical profession uh, and members thereof in particular. Um, So, you know, Ken, in the case of Ms. Lewis, there was a recommendation by a committee, I think, that's responsible for making recommendations around the country or to cover the country that you have to be vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine and up to date with it to be eligible for a transplant. So, you know, if you are looking at criminal charges against the transplant team in Alberta who refused her that transplant, that's what they'd point to. So you have to go, you know, up the chain of command, as it were, to those committee members getting a conviction for something like that. And I'm just using this example because, um, you know, it's right in front of us at the moment. Given the uh, what many people would say, and you have said, Ken, and your colleagues, is the failure of the court system to protect Canadians, along with all the other institutions that have failed, you'd have to be skeptical uh, about getting a conviction in those circumstances. But when you Come to, for example, the officials who are still repeating over and over that mantra about safe and effective. When there are between 700 and 1,000 published peer-reviewed articles now challenging that uh, mantra and challenging that assumption of safety, then uh, no matter what their intentions are, you're into gross negligence, recklessness, and that's a form of criminal intent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the other things that struck me about reading the report is it's pretty hard hitting <clears throat> in terms of all these areas of impacts on society, but also the remedies. And I think you emphasize that there really can't be, quote, reconciliation without acknowledgement of truth and facts. And one of the brutal realities to, quote, reconciliation is accountability. And uh, justice in those cases, uh, it it does beg the question, uh, you know, you know, your recommendations about uh, criminal action in number of quarters or civil liability. As you look at, say, vaccines that have uh, demonstratively had impacts, negative impacts on people. So it is really quite stunning, the report that you've uh, tabled. So do you I mean, I think the other picture to this is that you document well in the report all the institutions that have, in essence, failed Canadians to ask those critical questions, to engender uh, not censorship, but rather healthy debate, uh, to be able to stand up for people's liberties, not just because people want their freedom, of course, but because 
it, in, 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 it, it allows us to have scientific debates about very important decisions. And so if you looked at that question, how would you describe, Ken, how institutions have failed Canadians? You know, that, that, that could take three, four hours in Indeed. and of itself. But every, you know, unfortunately, the rot in our democracy and in our institutions has been going on for decades. And the trouble is, is you don't normally know that something is rotten until you need to, you need to support your weight on it. You need mm -hmm. to step on it. Yeah. And unfortunately, when this COVID-19 happened, we started to try to look to our institutions, to our constitution, to our charter of rights and freedoms. And what we found was it, it wasn't there. You know, I mean, we've got a charter of rights and freedoms that has an out clause in it, supposedly, and it can be triggered by the very people who the charter is supposed to protect us from. Mm -hmm. The charter is there to protect ordinary citizens from its government. Mm -hmm. And yet the government has an out. And they can say, well, no, <laughs> it's, <laughs> this, is, this is an unusual situation. No, mm -hmm. you don't need a charter of rights and freedoms. You don't need a, 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 a freedom of speech law. You don't need protection from genetic discrimination mm -hmm. law. If, if there's none of that going on, you know, it's yeah. like you don't need an umbrella if it isn't raining. Indeed. And unfortunately, the Canadians have been carried around this umbrella for 41 years and it's been sunny. And when we opened it up during the rain, when COVID hit, we found out it was it was full of holes. And and so, you know, we can look towards how our police failed us, how our our banking system failed us, how our unions failed us. They didn't stand up for the rights of their employees how uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the courts have failed us. I mean, using, using uh, principles of mootness and using principles of judicial notice, in other words, declaring that one side is, un you can't argue the, what they're trying to argue. Mm -hmm. That's not what, that's not what the, that, that principle was supposed to be for. Indeed. So the, you, you cited quite a list there of uh, institutions that you'd say have failed us. So I, I just want to ask a question. So can we just clarify what, what do you mean by the courts failing us and using the principle of mootness? Like there's been a lot of judges that have heard cases mm -hmm. that clearly had harm done, but have yes. put that aside. Can you, can you explain what mootness is in that context? M mootness is a, is a principle whereby the... Um, the decision is made that whatever has happened has happened. Mm -hmm. It can't happen again. And therefore it doesn't make any sense to take up the court's time to review it. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there was a challenge to the uh, travel restrictions under the charter of rights and freedoms. And the government essentially, according to the prime minister had suspended that ban and in court, the government lawyers argued that it had actually been canceled mm -hmm. where the, on the political side, they were saying it was merely suspended and it could come back. And the judge ruled that the whole argument was moot and therefore they would not hear the case mm -hmm. because indeed the government had canceled it, even though the prime minister was saying it's suspended. Indeed. So yeah. that's an instance of, of where the mootness should not have been used. Exactly. So chess in, in, when you look at institutions, are there ones that you'd want to highlight uh, from the report that you think Canadians need to know about? Well, yeah, just sticking with the law for a minute because that's my background. So Indeed. it's natural for me to take an interest in what's happened or not happened. Um, the, the, the <laughs> you know, the, one, one has to maintain as a barrister a level of respect for the institution of the law mm -hmm. and for individual judges as well. That said, we've been uh, failed time. And again, Ken's point about mootness is right. It may be that that has to be addressed by legislation so that judges can't use an escape hatch to avoid dealing with a thorny topic that they'd rather not deal with for whatever the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and we mentioned criminal charges uh, before. My own view on that is uh, nothing of that nature is going to happen until the pendulum uh, in society swings a lot more towards um, rejecting 
the experience of the last four years. There has to be more change in social attitudes about this. There also, I think, has to be a change of government in Ottawa and perhaps in various provinces as well. And that will itself also catalyze a change of attitude in the public. And it's only when you know the public accepts, is, is in the mood to and ready to accept criminal proceedings that we're going to see them. Well, I think it's a very powerful insight and, um, you know, I, I again congratulate um, the whole NCI commissioners and the, the whole team involved because it, it's, it's really remarkable. There was a very small paid staff, but it was what an army of citizens, including yourselves, that came forward. And I, I want to ask more of a personal question to you, Ken. Why did you decide to take on this kind of leadership role? Um, and and uh, I'll turn to you, Chess, as well. But this is really a remarkable undertaking. Well, it's it's a really good question. You know, I retired, and and I was looking forward to spending time with my grandchildren. And and in that is your answer. Mm -hmm. You know, when 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 my little grandchildren come running in, you know, they're at the age where Grandpa can do no harm. Mm -hmm. You know, they come running in, they wrap themselves around my legs and they look up to grandpa like he is much more than he is. And it, it occurred it occurred to me when I found out they were going to their kindergartens with masks on that what would I tell them 10 years from now or 15 years from now when they said to me, grandpa, Indeed. where were you? Indeed, well said. What about you, Chess? Why did you get involved in this incredible undertaking? I think the real trigger for me was the the vaccines and then the enforcement of the vaccines, the so-called mandates, the abuse of people's autonomy, sovereignty, right to inform consent, everything that we've taken as established principles, uh, not just of ethics, but the law as well, mm -hmm. since the end of the Second World War, if not before that. Um, that's what really triggered me. And so I started doing a deep dive into trying to understand what in the heck was going on in Canadian society mm -hmm. and the world for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody who I was corresponding with and talking to, because, you know, initially it, it, there was this sort of mass hysteria going on. And the number of people or, you know, identifying people you could actually talk to rationally was quite a challenge. And uh, this lady suggested, look, uh, this NCI, the, um, Nash the uh, National Citizens Inquiry is, is, is getting off the ground. Maybe you'd be interested in getting involved with it. So that's when I took an interest. It was probably a year ago or a bit more in November. And then in December, I think I filled out the application to be a commissioner. Mm. Uh, but as it transpired, it seemed that I could play a more useful role because I have a political background being uh, uh, until recently leader of the opposition in my home province. It was thought uh, correctly, no doubt, that um, you know it would be better to have people without identifiable recent political connections. Mm -hmm. So I took a somewhat different role. But um, you know, I, it's given a sense of meaning and purpose to my life in retirement mm -hmm. to be part of a great project to make Canada a better place. Indeed. And I want to thank Ken and the commissioners and everyone else involved with this project for, for the opportunity to do that. So bravo. And Ken, could you introduce uh, who the other commissioners were? Absolutely. There were four commissioners. Uh, they were chosen from different geographic areas and in uh, different areas of expertise. So there is myself. I'm a professional engineer and I'm from Manitoba. Uh, Janice Kakayan is uh, does uh, work in the social sciences area, and she's from Ontario. Dr. Bernard Massey is a retired researcher from the NRC. He's from Sherpa, Quebec. And the last commissioner was Heather D. Gregorio, and she's from Calgary. She's a lawyer. Well, you certainly had an incredible team of uh, commissioners and, and staff, and of course, uh, Sean Buckley is, is a lead uh, lawyer, and many other lawyers who participated as well. And I, get, I guess one of the things that struck me was um, the, the range of testimony that was given. I certainly participated in a number of days and, and observed that testimony. And, 
and uh, I was just very moved by the people's stories about how they could not be with a loved one when they were dying or when they were, um, I would say, essentially persecuted or dealt with very real issues of wanting to worship uh, and not being allowed to by almost, um, I, I would say, uh, zealots within the policing community that took an over, overreaching approach to um, uh, prosecuting and, and I'll dare, dare I say persecuting uh, people within uh, areas of faith. You know, you could go to Walmart, but you could not go to church as an, as an absurd example. And so within that context as well, I think it was stunning the kind of um, expertise that you had that gave uh, testimony now, which is, um, I mean, this has all unfolded the last year. But I think as we look at the kind of documentation of information, it's remarkable how much you are at the beginning of the wave. You are ahead of the curve, if you will, in terms of um, identifying so many of the truths that, that people as Canadians in me some measure, still don't know about. And I, I think you summarize those things. So what, what are the things that you would want Canadians to know now? Because there's so many assertions that were made by various uh, decision makers, and I realize there was a sense of crisis, of course. But um, in retrospect, we, we know a lot of things now that were being asserted that were actually not accurate. We're, are, what are the examples that come to your mind, Chess and Ken? We, we talked about the safety of the vaccines, mm -hmm. Uh, and um, I like to refer to facts beyond dispute that are not disputed by the authorities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can bring this up in, in the, whatever company you want and say, here's a fact beyond dispute. Yeah. Uh, it is admitted mm -hmm. that the, the COVID-19 vaccines are contaminated by foreign DNA. Indeed, yes. And no one can dispute that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can ask a question. Would you have consented to get the injection if you knew that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, we haven't talked about effectiveness, really. And, you know, I think what I'd say there is uh, we were given lie after lie after lie <laughs> about the effectiveness of these products. Indeed. Starting with uh, things like it stays in the arm and mm -hmm. doesn't travel around the body. Well, that was exposed as a lie by you know, reasonably early on by people like Dr. B um, Bridal uh, and others. Mm -hmm. And that has never been argued with because it happens to be present in Pfizer's own studies and those of others. And you can go on down a list. For example, very importantly, it does not stop infection and transmission. Mm -hmm. These products are very leaky. Exactly. So, that wasn't what we were told at the outset, was it? But they knew otherwise from the trials, if not before that. So we were lied to. And I can go on down a list of other lies we were told. They were lies because they knew better. Yeah. And, and this is something I, I think that's maybe hard to understand for a lot of Canadians is that given the release of information from the so-called Twitter files and other sources, I mean, it's stunning the amount of information that's now coming out. They knew that they were aware of what they were doing. I mean, there was at least a number of parties certainly did. So this is, this is the quandary that we're in now, Chess. It's, it's almost hard to explain to people uh, the kind of safety and, you know, and questions around uh, efficacy at stake here. What about you, Ken? What would you say? Well, just like uh, chess, I could go on and on, but, you know, they even, <laughs> I think they lied to themselves. Mm. You know, Canada had an influenza pandemic plan. Indeed. And it was chiefly authored by Theresa Tam. And in that report, it said you should not use masking. It said you should not, you should not be locking people down. Sorry, Theresa it, Tam, Dr. Theresa Tam, Dr. Theresa Tam recommended in that plan that we should not be wearing masks should not be wearing masks we should not be doing mass lockdowns um and, and it's a 500 and some odd page report and almost everything that was in that report they did the opposite of so they when they talk about they were following the science exactly what science was that because their own report prepared by the same people mm -hmm. who imposed these things on us 
were telling us the opposite. And that report, by the way, the Canadian Influenza Pandemic Plan, uh, it's referenced in our report, but you can find it on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see who uh, it, the, the, the list of authors is pages and pages and pages, our contributors, I should say, pages and pages long. And most of the people that were involved in the implementation of what they implemented in 2020 were authors or, or contributors to that report. So how, how did we, how did we change that? You know, how did they, how did they declare a national emergency and lock down the country in March of 2020 when they were reporting one, I believe he was 81 or 82 year old man, they said had died from COVID-19, one out of 40 million people. And at the time they were reporting, I think the numbers it's in the report was around 1200 cases of infection, but we don't know how they determined they were infected. Were those laboratory analysis? Were they PCR tests? We just don't know. So how is it that they locked the whole country down at that time? Now, I think another interesting little statistic, and, and this isn't so much in the report, but you know the number of Canadians that the health system is reporting died from the vaccine, last I looked, was in the mid-400s which is very unre un low unreported mm -hmm. uh, numbers. But when you compare that to the number of, of uh, gun-related fatalities in the country, it's over double. Wow. And yet we're still saying, take these vaccines. I mean, I, I see those ads coming out daily, take the vaccine, take the vaccine. And they've, they've occurred caused more reported deaths in Canada than we have from gun violence. No, it, it, it's stunning. And, and, you know, we can all speculate about why things went so off the rails when we had this uh, pandemic plan and we frankly didn't follow it. But I think part of it had to do with the constant drumbeat. And, and uh, we know, of course, uh, now through uh, the Twitter files and those receipts, we have that information that much of this was certainly orchestrated out of different bodies, and particularly in the United States, by the government itself to instill not an atmosphere of confidence, but of fear, and to be able to uh, justify somehow that lockdowns were appropriate. And I think within that environment, politicians, of course, are very concerned about their, their livelihoods and, and kind of respond to that fear. And, and really, it's very difficult to diffuse that kind of tidal wave of fear. And, and uh, the media were, were critical to this. Were they not chess in terms of, of pushing that kind of fear narrative? Yeah, because that's uh, the mainstream media certainly does have a big role in shaping people's psychological attitude and what they think is the truth and what the facts are they think, and they played a role in amplifying and and implementing a program of inculcation of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ken has heard me say this before, I guess, but I can't help but think of what Roosevelt said, FDR when he became president, 1932, at his inauguration. We have nothing to fear except fear itself. Indeed. But we threw all that out. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be a great country, as America has been up until recently, on a diet of fear. You have to be courageous. You also have to keep your wits about you and implement the carefully thought out planning that went into what would happen if there were a respiratory viral uh, pandemic which we had done, we did that work. And I'd like to know what it was that Dr. Tam told the Canadian cabinet, because they were the decision makers on this, Mr. Trudeau's cabinet. Mm -hmm. Did she tell them, look, here's the position, you shouldn't do it, it was thought out before, here's the plan, and did they reject it? What would she tell us if she was asked uh, what her role in that was? Indeed. Did she give them the advice that almost any rational person would think she was obliged to give them? Mm -hmm. When they re obviously rejected that, um, she would probably say, well, uh, my job was imp to implement what the cabinet told me to do. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I was just there to execute. That's probably what she'd mm -hmm. say. Well, it certainly begs the question to what extent many political uh, figures were actually fully in charge of managing the crisis, but really hid behind the good names and roles of uh, the doctors. Um, but I do want to uh, follow up on the media side, because I think what Chess said is very powerful as a summary. And so, Ken, I noticed that the report makes some pretty 
interesting narrative about uh, the role of the media and even about the CBC. Can you share with us more about those recommendations? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I, I think I can think logically. And I know that a, a, a restriction on free speech, there's always been restriction. And the, and the famous example is you can't go into a crowded theater mm -hmm. and scream fire. But that's exactly what the CBC and our private broadcasters did in Canada. They, they not only went into a crowded theater and called fire, but they kept yelling it 24 seven, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was a complete shutdown of any debate, any investigation. We heard testimony from Marianne Cloak, who was an investigative reporter in CBC, and, and yes. she detailed exactly how they shut her down. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible what, and, and they're still doing it now. You know, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to admit to you that I keep looking on the mainstream media feeds to see some kind of an announcement about yeah. the national citizens right. inquiry. Yeah. And instead, you know what I saw last night was a big story that went national about a kangaroo escaping from the zoo in Ontario. Wow. So, so that went national, but they haven't made a peep out of the National Citizens Inquiry. And I think in that and in itself tells you that they haven't learned a lesson. Mm -hmm. They're still doing the same thing. They're still blockading the truth. And frankly, I think the CBC is beyond repair. I think, they're, I think they've long outlived what their original reason for being was. Mm -hmm. And this cancer of lies and and cover up mm -hmm. is in stage four, and it's time to dismantle and remove the CBC and use that one point five billion dollars a year to help Canadians rather than brainwashing.